So uh, we can start up and introduce myself. Um, this is our geospatial tour for the spring 2023 semester. Um, and I assigned myself to speak first. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I am the um, academic program coordinator for the GIST programs, and I have been on campus almost exactly seven months, I guess, at this point. Um, although I was on campus 20 years ago, I uh, got a PhD at Geology and Geophysics and graduated in 2003. And then I had a 20 year career at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, on teaching mainly, and um, was very excited to be able to grab an opportunity to come back to the University of Wyoming. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, digital mapping, data visualization, and the geologist superpower. <laughs> Um, so digital mapping, from my point of view, is mostly geologic mapping, um, and I have a couple of geologic maps um, that students made on the introductory screen here. So there's a student's geologic map um, of a part of the Wachita Mountains in Arkansas. Um, I was privileged to be able to teach uh, field courses at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, um, and then I also have been privileged to be a part of a field course, a geology field camp that is taught by James Madison University. I've been a, a visiting instructor with them for six years. I'm going to go in this spring. I'm so excited. And they teach in Ireland. So I have some examples from the field courses in Arkansas that Rhea Little Rock teaches and in Colorado that where we teach, and then also in Ireland with James Madison University's group. Um, so that's been my experience. And of course, the one on the left is kind of the traditional paper-based geologic map. It is a data visualization. There's a lot of information conveyed in geologic maps. And then the one on the right is a um, digital produced like, from start to finish uh, geologic map. So I've spanned that time frame. I was taught this way, paper based, even without a GPS unit, very low technology. The highest technology we had, I think, was the front compass, which is certainly good technology, right? It's good technology nonetheless. Um, and I, I wanted to start with basic geologic mapping because this. The process of creating maps for geologists is the way that we sort of gain our superpower. I know you want to hear about the superpower. <laughs> um, which is very closely integrated, I think, with GICT professional superpower as well. But um, I just wanted to show uh, in the lower left-hand corner, um, let's see, I can use that, that pointer here. So I put a box here. This is where we start this project. And you see some polygons. You see some um, alphabetic sim symbols, and you see some uh, line symbols. Uh, and this was you know, where we start in the field of geology. We go out, we want to make accurate observations and measurements of rocks in the field, bedrock mapping, um, and place them in their correct location on a map so we can cover an area, figure out what's going on at the surface with respect to the geology. but all of this data, it's not only surface data, it's also subsurface data. So I know there's a lot of geologists in the room, but there's some folks in the room that aren't geologists. And this information, the polygons, the colored polygons that run across the map, this tells me as a geologist that there's a rock layer that is intercepting the flat Earth surface. Not perfectly flat, but on a map it's flat. <laughs> um, and it's running east and west. And you can see that on this map, roughly east and west, like the yellow. Yeah, the uh, be it's sure, by the way, nobody cares. <laughs> and um, then you see these symbols that look like little T's. This is strike and dip symbol. And this tells us, as a geologist, um, that we actually had some rocks exposed at the surface, right at the sort of intersection. Of, you do it right, right at the intersection of the little small part of the T and the long part of the T. Um, the strike symbol is the way that the beds are running across the earth. So the layer is running across the earth, intersecting the earth's surface, running east and west. The little tiny little part, actually, you should look up here where it's larger. I did that on purpose. The tiny little part of the T points to the north. That tells the geologists that the beds are diving into the earth towards the north. The number tells you at what angle from the horizontal. So these beds down in this corner are running. They're three-dimensional objects. They're running east and west, and they're diving off into the earth toward the north at 46, 50, 41, roughly 45 degrees. Um, and so this is huge. Like this is like the very first data point you take as a geologist. You start to 
build a hypothesis based on the sort of first principles of geology. So if you remember if you ever took geology like rocks are way down horizontal, one on the bottom is the oldest, and the next one is a little bit younger and a little bit younger. So when you see or when you take a strike and dip, you already have a hypothesis You're like, ah, running east west. If I walk north, because it's dipping north, I should see another unit that's also running east and west. And this is the, the process of making a geologic map is building a hypothesis that you continue continuously test as you walk across the landscape. And once you complete the entire map, you can then, whoops, oh, I wanted to say that this can be done with very low tech instruments and tools. Uh, so this is uh, me right here, um, some time ago. Um, taking a strike and dip, collecting it on the edge of a rock layer. And so these are the tools, a field notebook, paper-based map, pocket uh, transit, a compass, hand lens, rock hammer, camera. That's pretty much what you need. Pretty low tech. Um, you can collect all this information. Collect it across the 2D surface, and then you can project. So you see this long line here, A to A prime. There's A up here, A prime here, north, south. Um, this is where we started. So we were looking at like OBF, and again, it's a layer of rock that's diving into the earth towards the north at about 45 degrees. Way up here on the other side, there's data that says it's like 85, 74, and there's an like overturn symbol, so they're actually like opposite of the way they were way down. So this, this structure is a thin climb. Started out, rocks being deposited flat, then they were uh, uplifted and folded at some time and actually folded to be overturned. This is huge. This is huge, like to, to be able to go from 2D surface data to 3D subsurface data. And then you can start to put the history together. What happened first? What happened second? What happened third, fourth, fifth, so on for this area? This is our superpower. <laughs> um, it's not that making the maps, it's thinking, thinking spatially and temporal. This is the geologist's superpower. Almost nobody does this. The way we do it. There, there are some similarities, but almost nobody does it the way geologists do it. And it's so important. So notice I had um, thinking <laughs> this you know surface that I would walk across, make some observations, and project beneath the surface. This is an anticline. Right? Um, but then you know this one had to be there first before this one, before this one, and then they were flat lined if they were folded, and then they were eroded to get what's in the surface. That's a lot of information. Thinking spatially, thinking temporally. Geology is a deeper power. <laughs> very, very, very important to things like infrastructure. Where do we build? Energy resources. Where do we find the things we need to have the digital devices we have? Uh, water. So we live. <laughs> um, hazards. Geologic hazards. We don't have to look too far into the news right now to understand that we need to know more about geologic hazards. Um, and I would say also curiosity. You know about the earth. So we, we really, this is a skill that's really, really important, really, really relevant. There are a lot of geologists today that um, map, I mean, there actually are more than you think, but you know, we sometimes argue like, why do we still teach mapping this way? But it's because it's teaching that spatial and temporal thinking. So I think students still need to do this. They may never do it again, but they're going to use a map. They're going to use a geologic map. Um, so getting into the why should we go digital? And there's sort of arguments in the world about whether or not we should, um, because it is so important to kind of start with the basics. Um, but, um, and this, so this is um, my, my history of starting to go digital. So I, as a student, we just read maps. We interpreted topo lines to figure out where we were. And we used like stereo glasses to figure out where we were on the landscape. We didn't have a GPS. Um, when I was, uh, I went to uh, grad school here and I was a TA for the uh, field camp. And that's what I think the first time they ever used a GPS in the field for a geologic map. Wow. <laughs> Figure out where you are without having to triangulate or you know, get the lines. It's pretty cool. So, yeah, we should adopt digital devices. They help us at the same time, allow us to you know, more efficiently, more effectively collect geologic data. Um, so, when I first started teaching, this is a couple of years after I started teaching in Arkansas. I was all going, oh, let's like, go digital. Let's figure out how to get the digital stuff into uh, mapping. And this is the first thing we bought. You guys remember this thing? With this like you know, GPS, like where do you put it? We actually got Velcro and like oh, the pass, um, or or got the little uh, so that thing that keeps it from getting wet, you know, when you're crafting or whatever. Um, and these things were great. They actually are easy to carry. 
some clear face, direct digital collection, very small screen, that's not good for geosis. Um, so we still actually carry these maps in the field with us. Uh, poor battery life to begin with. Um, oops, I'm sorry for those online and thinking <laughs> to the screen, not to me, uh, but you guys can see, so I apologize for that. Uh, pocket transit compass, you still needed to collect those measurements from the ground, still need a camera, still need a hammer and a hand lens. Um, these things, I guess, uh, in, in sort of the early versions of the visualization, sort of that could come right out of these things, was really simple um, representations, so points and lines. And for geologists, that's not great. That sort of takes you out of that hypothesis testing because those symbols on a map mean something three dimensional. And that process of walking across the landscape and putting those things on the map, um, it just, like, you still need that. So this is not perfect. So we still actually have paper based maps. We still put symbols on the map, but we also collect our data digital. So it's like we're collecting the data twice um, when we're doing this. So hard to do that um, continuous hypothesis testing. And then, of course, you still need to export to GIS software. So the next step we made was to buy these um, Explore tablet PCs. Anybody remember those at all? Um, this was actually not a, a couple of years later. Um, so this is the early version. They still exist. I'm sure they're much better. But the early version, um, definitely large screen. This is great. Collect the data right into um, software, GIS software, which you could actually use some symbology. Um, you can edit on the move. Um, these things were heavy. <laughs> Uh, they would uh, overheat really quickly or get too cold. Uh, prone to crashing, the last battery life at that time was a problem. Um, the software, so going straight into a uh, reason arc map, or arc desk software it was called back then. Um, and it's a steep learning curve and not optimized for mobile collection of data. Um, and so you still need your field notebook. I guess there are little ways to take notes, but it wasn't quite optimized at that time. Uh, but you still need your compass, just you need your hammer, you need your hammer, you need your hammers. Um, so we're carrying a lot of stuff, um, but we're moving moving forward a little bit. Uh, these are, of course, what can be produced by you know getting your digital data immediately into the software that you needed, um, and then produce some nice, uh, nice geologic maps. Um, although sometimes you have to convert. Well, you all know. <laughs> Um, this, by the way, is uh, San Juan Mountains, in Colorado. This is just, I think, just about six miles south of uh, Silverton area. If you've ever been there, it's a beautiful spot. Let's see. So, flash forward. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a Penrose conference. Uh, those in the geology world know the Penrose conferences are these um, supported by the Geological Society of America to bring sort of small groups of people to do some very specific, um, you know. So it's a small conference and you really kind of share information on learning things. And there was one in 2009 at the Google Books, Google Complex. And I got to go there and uh, I met some folks from James Madison University. We were talking about what we we're doing with digital mapping. They're like, hey, you want to go to Ireland? And I'm like, you don't have this choice. No problem. And so when I started going to the field camp in Ireland, they were using iPads, the earliest version of the iPads, um, which um, uh, have gotten better and better and better in terms of the ability to collect digital data in the field and get it into software that's optimized for geologists that you can do this sort of hypothesis testing in the field. Um, and of course the iPads have a magnetometer inside them, they have a gyroscope, they have GNSS, GPS antennas, they have um, a compass, or well, I mean, yeah, they have a compass, um, they have connectivity, uh, and Ireland's very well connected. It's a small country, so even when you feel like you're way out in the back of the you're still to be very well connected um, to the internet and like upload your data from the top of a mountain. <laughs> Not so easy to do that here. But the software and the iPads can still talk to the GPS if you get the cellular one, um, even if you, know, you don't have to be online to do that. You, know, you don't need the cellular uh, plan either, but the cellular one has that. Aspect. The newest iPads, the iPad Pro, I think also the iPhone Pro, have LiDAR scanners uh, standard these days. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> That's next. Okay. So this potentially you know, replaces field notebook because there's optimized note taking um, on the iPad for geologists. The um, compass, because you can use the iPad itself to figure out its orientation. You know, end up on a, a rocket and figure out its orientation in space. Uh, a camera is in the iPad. Um, so all these things kind of in one device, this is kind of where we're going. It's still maybe not perfect. It's still, there's still some glitches. Um, 
But students, it's very intuitive. Everybody is now so used to doing the smartphones <laughs> and smart tablets. Um, and so uh, teaching the technology is a little easier than it used to be. Um, and there's the ability to edit as you're in the field and do that hypothesis testing and using, I guess I should uh, go forward to show you the um, app that we, that I have used most often. There's several apps, but this is the one that I've used most often. It's called the Bravo Spot, named after the geographer. <laughs> Um, and the concept of Strabo Spot, um, it's part of the uh, kind of late maybe entry into EarthCube. If you know what EarthCube is, this is the geosciences. It's kind of trying to uh, bring all the data that gets produced by real time monitoring, by um, different you know, campaigns of data gathering into one place where groups can access it more easily. And they kind of, um, this group that worked on Strabo Spot, uh, realized that there was sort of a lack of um, sort of a field scientists and field data was still a lot on paper and in field notebooks and actually very hard for more than just the people involved in that research to access. So the Travel Spot has a, a mobile app and it has an um, online portal and you um, can upload whatever you want to into the online portal and share it with anybody. So it's a way to um, Organize the data in such a way that uh, other people can use it more easily than in the past. With maybe, you know, in the past, sometimes you just Xerox field notebook and gave it to somebody and they had to interpret it. Um, okay, so that's, it, it, it's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. Um, this is a picture, actually, I brought my iPad. <laughs> I didn't get it out. I brought my organized iPad. Um, now, so it's actually, you, know, you buy these ruggedized cases and just, it around your neck and walk around in the field and you know here's your here's your field pouch here's your field pouch here's your way to uh, take the spike and dip and, and long battery life larger screen um works pretty well so here's a screen capture of part of the interface in the travel spot and this is uh the workflow you know you start a project you add base maps while you're connected um to the internet and it can be multiple different kinds of base maps um you know, Hillshades, uh, topo maps, um, somebody else's geologic map uh, that you can add in there and then save them and title them for easy you know, zooming in and out. Um, um, wait a minute, that's not right, is it? It's um, pyramids, great pyramids, so easy zoom in and out. Uh, and so you can use them offline, which is awesome. You turn them off on. Um, submit your daily logs. So this is like the you know, first little bit. Um, if you look book when it's like, what's the like, what's the temperature, what's the weather, you know, overcast, colors look differently versus when it's bright sunshine, or when you're out in the field, things like that. Um, create your points, your lines, your polygons. Uh, tags are the ability in this world to associate things kind of relationally. Um, the, the database that they use is not a relational database, it's a graphic database. And I'm not, you guys probably, so you understand that more than I do, but it allows, um, think better ability uh, to connect things in the way that geologists connect things is what I understand that works and clear things. Um, and then there's some the spot idea uh, is that you can collect data at multiple different um, resolutions and uh, which is hard to do in a pure GIS, MARC GIS, ArcGIS Pro. There's so many Bits of data that you might actually collect at one small outcrop that is smaller than the resolution of GPS location. And so this allows for um, a better sort of integration of data, even like from the thin section level. And you can add that kind of information in here and tie it to a spot. And then it's all nested. And I guess that also explains the uh, graphic database that things are hierarchical. Pretty interesting. It also has the ability to make, you know, as you're going, something that looks more like a geologic map. So these are screen grabs from uh, a location in Ireland, one of the locations in Ireland that um, I've had the privilege of being able to uh, teach students and map in. And you can um, fairly easily add the features that geologists are used to to this software and do that sort of hypothesis testing as you're moving through the field and frequently change it um, as you're moving through the field. Um, Let's see. It also, uh, again, one of the huge things about Struggle Spot is this sort of 
cloud storage and the ability to share. So for example, a top map, this is again in um, Western Ireland, the top map is an example of data collected by one expert geologist uh, in uh, this mountain, this mountain right here in Cora. Um, and my favorite lake, this is Lake Nahui. His name is Nahui. <laughs> and Lake Mexico, uh, or Loch Nahui. <laughs> uh, this is data collected by students over several years of the same area. Um, and if you look really closely, these are striking dip data. They're colored by the different formations. Um, but this is again sort of a, a, they built it such that it would make it much easier for shared geologic data. Um, so you can, you know, somebody else had already been there last year, they put it up on the cloud, you can bring it down and add it to your map and add your data. Um, so you can see the difference of uh, one expert geologist and then several, several years, several years of uh, 12 to 25 students um, collecting data over those years. And let's see, this is um, this is the uh, expert interpretation of that data. Um, so adding the uh, linear features there to designate the units, so those three-dimensional packages of rock, and then um, the black lines are faults, so where they're offset, and then the pink lines are uh, there's a hole down there. It's also an offset. Um, it's really great to area. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, all right, so well, why is this so important? So I think it's super important to go to digital mapping. Um, it's really important to preserve those fundamental, um, you know, teaching people how to think spatially and temporally. So it, it, it can be careful about you know using digital technology in the field because it could just become kind of a black box. And so I think um, it's important to think about it to preserve those things that. Get us to think spatially and temporally. But this is you know huge in terms of being able to share data in a much more efficient and effective way. Um, and this is where we need to go. This I stole from um there's the uh the actual names of my references. There's a study that was put out in 2019, a report uh, with the move in the geosciences to try to go to true 3D reconstructions. So Data visualizations that GIS and T professionals do. So, this is, I think, the GIS and T professional superpower is taking the way that geologists think, really and generally, and visualizing it in you know, the GIS and T world with lots of different products. And so, one of the ideas is you know, you have this big database um, where you can pull out 3D modeling, 3D visualizations, web viewing, and querying, but the input are the 3D models. The seismic data collected by seismologists, geochemistry data that's done on samples collected across the landscape, the bedrock geology mapping, uh, which is what I've just kind of gone through in the first part of this talk, so official mapping, you know, all the other data you can collect, paleontology, uh, all of the other data you can collect as a geologist, put that into the container that then can be visualized in a much more um, I don't know, like basically trying to get other people to be able to think like a geologist, right? And so some of those examples, let's see if I, um, this is the Minnesota Geological Survey. They have some greedy geology for, um, these are watersheds, and I have an example, let me see if I can, it's gonna work, Cody. What are you trying to do? Uh, if I bring up the, um, I go out of here. Okay, yeah. Okay, have it right uh, here. Yeah, we're on it. Okay, welcome. Um, this is the live website for this work. Um, so they are putting together. These data visualizations that are true 3D reconstructions that are containers but way more information than just the bedrock geology that you can interact with. And so uh, let's see if I uh, notes here. You know, this works really well when you're in your own office. There we go. Um, let's turn off the uh, spatial geology, the subsurface spatial geology, and the face map, and the reference information, and the watershed boundary. Just get the 
better out job. Okay. So, um, you know, geologic maps are notoriously, like, they're so chock full of information. There's so much information in them. You know, a static geologic map. It's got all the colors, it's got all the different symbols. Um, it, it probably, cartography, it like, you know, you're trying to like show people simple information and break all the rules, right? But it's because it's trying to convey like important information, a lot of information, but in part, the non geologists sort of understand what they're looking at. And for this is where I think it's really important for us to go to digital and to build these 3D reconstructions to try to get other people to understand what, you know, we see. Because again, energy resources, hazards, infrastructure, a lot of decisions we need to make right now depend upon, are underpinned by geology. And we need more people to understand that. Um, and they don't have time to get all that background. But if we can visualize that better, then we can maybe make some better decisions. That's one example. Here's another example that I'll show just because I'm here. This is cool. Um, I've got a kid who are in Minecraft. This is a Minecraft reconstruction of dinosaur uh, prevention. Uh, another way to help visualize geology. Um, and luckily, there, their geology is sort of like layer cake. <laughs> but you can't, you can't. Like, we'll compromise your work in Minecraft. Okay. Ooh, okay. 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 Yeah, this was, all right. That's the uh, uh, so if you're interested in this, um, Minnesota Geological Survey has several examples of these three models, and uh, Alberta Geological Survey. Um, this is Alberta Geological Survey as well. So augmented reality and virtual reality. They've developed, you know, basically it's things you can look at and point your device at, and then it'll pop up in 3D, and you can manipulate it. Um, or have the uh, virtual Oculus Rift or whatever it is these days. Um, so this is the fellow with that device on his face and then the uh, controllers there. So that's the point of view of the, well, it's like weird looking, right? You can see this thing floating in space, but the point of view of, of what, you know, the person is seeing through the controls and you can it, zoom in, zoom out, see all kinds of information. Um, these are cool. So these are from digital data producing physical models. The one at the top is a glass engraved, uh, laser engraved model of the subsurface of Vienna, Austria. Uh, and then the one at the bottom is from Alberta Geological Survey again. They've got a piece of river model and it actually comes apart. So 3D printed, it comes apart so you can take it apart and put back together again. So again, really amazing visualization tool then and teaching tools, which we have the ability <laughs> as GIC professionals to you know, make this thing real. And that was this. I was already there, I showed you that. So, this next step, move on. Ooh, okay, so, you know, again, why is this so important? Um, geology underpins infrastructure, underpins minerals, energy, yeah. hazards, water resources. These things align up with the level of human um, sustainability goals. So, uh, affordable um, and clean energy, uh, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, life on land. Hazards apply to some of that. Um, clean water, responsible consumption and production of so minerals, you know, birth to death or birth to cradle grave. Um, all these things depend on geology. And we as geologists can see this, but a lot of non geologists cannot. And so we as GIST professionals need to help make some of these things reality so that the rest of us or there are people that are, you know, Working toward making some of these decisions, policymakers can understand better. Um, and of course, curiosity. Um, still really interested in just knowing more about the Earth and uh, you know, just preferences. Um, hard to see, but there's a great. What is it called? It's the um, special report on uh, 3D. 3D models in the geosciences, right? A whole bunch of these figures from examples. And I will uh, thank you for your time and uh, take any questions that you might have. Uh, being of a similar vintage, doing this transition from paper to digital. 
something we're starting to notice now is there's scale issues with these because anybody can zoom into one foot cell size on these rasters and you tend to over collect data or over represent data versus the accuracy that you actually collected at. Yeah. And so maybe that's the next challenge we're moving towards now. I'm curious about what your thoughts yeah. are. So Strabo bought that software kind of has a like it, it um there I guess you have to like get this person who's collecting it to understand what they're doing. Um, but Strabo Spot has this instead of like location for every point, the relational um, uh, uh, associations you can make. And it also, I mean, also has the ability to sort of deal with like a thin section scale and have, you know, things, information tied to a scale on a thin section. Within the same database as the you know DEM of like a one to one thousand you know, scale map, so that that is one of the goals of Strabo Spots. There, there's a paper. Um, that's in the, I can send you the paper reference that talks about uh, just that with Strabo Spot trying to solve. So really thinking about how would geologists, especially structural geologists, collect data. Yeah, so, so structural geologists sometimes collect like, a whole bunch of data just in an hour. Get like the, the, the fabrics of um, deformation or maybe old information. Um, and yeah, like if you're doing that with the GPS unit, they're going to be <laughs> all over the place. Um, so this allows for, for that. Yeah. Somebody else has a question. Uh, so I'm Kyle Summer, I'm the manager at the Visualization Center here at SCAR. Um, and so we're, we're moving pretty heavily into visualizing subsurface data with VR and AR. Um, so two questions, I guess. Can I get the slide list with the links? Or can I get the slides? Yes, for sure. Um, and then can I follow up with you about some contacts that we Absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't done, I've mostly done the field collecting. Um, I did have one student, a master's student, who uh, got to go, he, because he was sort of a pack horse of carrying a MIDAR device into a cave, he got to use the data, and one of his project was to figure out if he could put that data into a Unity gaming yep. uh, software to use scientifically because it's so much easier mm -hmm. to sort of get into Unity, like learn the learning curve. And also, I think it is a, what you can download on freely. Uh, caveats apply, caveats. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, anyway, so uh, that's not the only experience. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we do have a LiDAR viewer constructed in Unity for that purpose, also. So, yeah, I'd like to, I'll, I'll follow up with you. Thanks. Yeah, oh, that's pretty open. Yeah, that one. Detailed models of bases. So, for detailed modeling of bases of rock properties, mineral grades, porosity, and scale smaller than the need formation, steel statistics just create likely models. Condition to direct data. Can you find it on these methods? I'm not sure I can. <laughs> so, I think, I mean, I think the idea is that uh, with 3D reconstructions, if it's spatial, it should be able to go into or be you know, combined somehow with the uh, type of models that maybe the Minnesota Geological Survey in the example. But uh, probably not a great answer to that question. <laughs> that question? Yeah. So I, I've done some experience in the field, and I'm in the opinion if it can go wrong, if it can break, it will break. Um, and so, can you speak at all to mitigating some issues, with, especially with students handling 30? I've had one in the field with no electricity. I assume it's doable. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah, in Ireland it's a little bit more uh uh maybe we don't camp. <laughs> um there's a, a research uh, educational station that we stay at, and um so every night there's access to electricity and uh people do carry um chargers, you know, the handle charger. It, it's amazing, and sometimes they crash. Oftentimes they just turn them off and turn back on. Um, Two, two people share, so usually in teaching, there's still somebody with a little bit in front of compass. <laughs> so, the backup, so you know, um, I say, well, you don't carry it with you. Um, the faculty, it's sort of left it behind, but the students do carry it with them. Yeah, it's not without its 
problems, but I've also seen, you know, a field note book go down a cliff. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also uh, Matt Ward in two weeks. Do you think the students, like, do you, do they take ownership of their tablet and take care of it, or do you find that you have to play <laughs> parent and? Yeah, amazingly enough, um, very few cracked screens. Uh, it happens, but amazingly enough. Um, but they charge it, they don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a pretty good setup, sort of, you know, pretty good sort of like protocol, I guess. So, <laughs> Jeff. You mentioned Brenton, and um, we all know about the, <laughs> the classic instrument, but I know you had an opportunity to meet with um, the Brenton folks this past fall, and they're kind of under new ownership recently, I think, right? And based again back in Riverton. Do um, you see some opportunities to, you know, like a company like that to sort of move into, you know, <laughs> merging with some of these things like the Strabo kind of software? I mean, is, like when you think about the future yeah. of, of this, are, yeah, are it's these interesting. Technologies um, merging together in any way, and there there have been studies done that compare the Bretons to um, the to iPads and to um, Android phones and iPhones for making striking it. And there's a um, pretty good um, agreement, except for really shallow dipping rocks or really deep dipping rocks. Apparently the Runs are much more accurate, more accurate, which are very steep to dipping rocks. A lot easier to take a strike and dip on a steeply dipping rock. Um, the shallow ones tend to be better with the iPhone, iPad. Android apparently is less good. It's sort of we're getting a similar. Um, so there, there have been studies on that. So, and, and I know, I know some, you know, geologists who are my age or older who are you know, using them. <laughs> Using their devices and you have not, you know, it's not with me anymore, which is, I can't do that. I think, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think if they could get it to um, digitally, you know, send data to a device, that would be a way for them to keep, keep um, innovate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know. And, you do, and there is, you do kind of have to pay attention to how you orient the uh, phone on the iPad. So there is, there is some, you do that. Too, but it's pretty amazing. And there are, there are times too when you're like, oh, I'm definitely not there. It's you know, snapping me over here. So GPS issues, and you're like, mm -hmm. but you have the base map behind you. And I wonder though, see, I don't know how to read the map, right? And so I do wonder about students right now, if they are actually sort of learning <laughs> How to interpret topo lines? We never had hill shades. Hill shades are really great. Uh, during during COVID, I taught a field camp fully online. I know some other folks did that too, which was a little bit weird. But uh, we used um, the really high resolution hill shades that I had never looked at before for the area in Colorado that we mapped. And I saw in the hill shades like three or four places where I was like, "Holy crap! I've never gone there. I don't know why, but I'm gonna go there next time." You know, there's outcrop right there. I didn't know it was there. So there's you know benefits and drawbacks. It's not perfect yet. Uh, but it's getting there. <laughs> I think it will get there. But I think we have to go digital because of the sharing. Like it's so much easier to share data for an area. Oh, I see question. I'm just curious uh, on that slide. Um, that had like the inputs and outputs. Um, one of them was AirView <coughs> for 3D visualization. Uh, the next one, so the right two. We we just don't have Sorry, that's that one. Yeah. Um, for 3D visualization, I'm seeing AirView there. How often are you seeing AirView actually used either for? Oh. I actually don't know. I grabbed this as a uh, just a conceptual, and so I don't know as much about. And this is specific to the uh, Geological Survey of Canada. I can give you that for reference. Um, so I just grabbed it as an example of uh, yeah, you know, the idea, concept. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's that's no, I don't. Wow, well, it's that in reference to in your mind. Well, I'm just thinking about there's a pair of you and the next visitor. How much big? 
there's a tool that I'm familiar with, and if I can get data from one of those databases to peer review, then I can probably mesh it, and I can probably get it on AR or PR outside. Something I really love, and I'm actually hoping to teach a field course this summer. Um, I put a proposal in to get some headbacks, but the new ones with the LIDAR. And so I hope to teach a field course this summer. It's not on the books yet, but uh, I'll have to figure out if it could be uh, 20 credits and when the best time would be. So I want to talk to the folks of geology. So I think there'd be some interest there, maybe. Um, as well as our folks, maybe the archaeology, anthropology, and anybody else who might be interested in the field of collection. It's awfully fun. <laughs> yeah, so. Different topic, yeah. just another, just a comment on, um, you had the kind of how do we connect geology to like the UN sustainable oh, yeah. development goals. Um, just a comment I can share. Um, there was recently kind of a draft of, of an idea of a, of a geospatial framework around um, addressing. The SDGs um, goals, um, and there was a recent presentation I think to the FGDC on this a Federal Geographic Data Committee um, from somebody at the UN. So happy to share that because I think it's kind of an interesting idea to think about how a particular discipline kind of, not to use the word differently, but maps on yeah. those goals. <laughs> you know? the, um, the two physicists have a, I forget which organization it is, have a really like they've mapped geophysics to every single one. Yeah, oh, they well, never really yeah. did like they have this field that they've created. Oh, okay. how geophysics can you know kind of address every single one of these things. Um, so, yeah, I think, I don't know, it seems pretty obvious to me <laughs> um, that this could be a better way to help us make decisions for the issues that we are facing today and in the future. Yeah. Did it right? <laughs> I can. I. Uh, you don't know me. <laughs> I can show up. <laughs> so thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, just a quick note. We have tea time at uh, Q every Wednesday. So if you are after the talk, it has the third floor. Uh, at the conference room, so you are welcome to uh, join us for a cup of tea. Well, and I'll say um, I'll, for our next speaker, which is in two weeks, it's another UW alum, Jamie Jones. You might remember him. So he's the uh, subject director of the uh, USGS Science Center in Alaska. He's going to talk about uh, using GS in prospect for critical He'll be joining us via a uh, 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 uh